Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sushant, for your time. So let, let's start off firstly with a little bit of context and background. Give us a, a, a brief run through of what vaccines are and why they're so important for overall health. Vaccines are the most um, successful public health intervention ever implemented and have saved millions of lives. Vaccines work by um, letting your body uh, first see a first uh, have a first exposure to a pathogen like a, a virus or a bacteria in a harmless way. Um, because what we see in nature is that um, once someone has had certain infections like measles, they don't catch that infection again. Their body becomes immune so that they can they don't get that infection twice. And a vaccine mimics that natural immunity. It allows the body to see that germ in a harmless way instead of having to um, get the disease and get ill from the disease uh, during the first exposure. And then the body remembers um, that, that, that germ and will mount a much more effective immune response on second exposure. Mm. What are the dangers with vaccines? And I'm asking this specifically because, as you've said, 224 years after vaccines were first invented um, and millions of lives saved, there are still many people who are fearful of having their children vaccinated and who believe they could lead to death or serious injury. Um, vaccines are the most, um, the most highly studied medication for safety. Uh, vaccines are, go through intensive safety um, investigation before they are licensed. So we can rest assured that a licensed vaccine has been thoroughly investigated and is uh, safe for use. What we do see is we do see local reactions like redness and swelling at the injection site. Um, sometimes there is a mild fever afterwards. Those are to be expected and they're really a sign that the body's immune response is working and is in generating a good response against um, that germ con contained in the vaccine. As an expert in the field, what would be your response to parents of children or family members, loved ones of someone that they claim has either died or been seriously injured by a vaccine? We can understand that a family going through that kind of trauma uh, would want to assign a cause to it. And, and obviously we have to be very, very sensitive. Vaccination, um, it, 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 it's a sensitive topic. But what is the medical response to try and set the minds of parents and loved ones at ease? Uh, the, the medical response is that vaccines are safe and highly effective to prevent very serious illnesses um, that kill children. And we shouldn't underestimate um, the dangers from, ch from childhood vaccine preventable illnesses. Hmm. Um, if anyone has a concern about a vaccine, they should report it. There is a reporting channel and their concerns will be investigated thoroughly. Um, but, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one level, their doctor would assess um, what happened and, and what the complaint is. But we can't, you know, what we often see is that um, children, as they go, as they age, um, children will uh, um, experience general childhood illnesses and childhood um, traumas and so on. And often those are at the same time as the vaccines that we give, which are 6, uh, 10, 14 weeks, 6 months, 1 year, etc., and, um, you know, we, we vaccinate millions of people. So if there were, were any problem with the vaccine, we would know there would be a pattern or a signal. Hmm. But for one individual person where their child has a particular illness or injury on a particular day, that might feel associated time-wise um, with the vaccine. But it's because so many children receive so many vaccines throughout their childhood that um, coincidentally there might be time associations. And that's hmm. why it might appear to one family um, to be causally related to a vaccine. But if there were any concerns around vaccines, um, those would be picked up through pattern recognition. And um, those are very, uh, very closely monitored and very closely watched. Mm -hmm. So I can um, safely you know, assure viewers um, that there are no concerns around the vaccines that are licensed in the South African mm -hmm. um, PR program, the expanded program on immunization. Um, and the vaccines are given to millions of children in South Africa and globally every year. Um, so parents can really rest assured yeah. um, about the safety of the products. And I think what we really see is, is, is the fact that, you know, we, we can see how much um, intensity, intense longing there is currently for a COVID-19 vaccine. So when a disease is very prevalent and people know other people who've died of that disease, then there is a lot of demand for a vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, but as the vaccine works and it's very effective at preventing that disease, so people forget about how terrible that disease is and they become a bit complacent. 
And that's usually what the problem is, I think, around people um, not wanting vaccines. It's really just because they've forgotten um, how terrible these diseases are. Uh, you know, measles has killed more than 6,000 uh, people in, in DRC this year, but we don't hear about it. Mm. Uh, we hear about Ebola in the DRC. So, you know, we forget how terrible um, child, regular mm. childhood illnesses like uh, measles and polio um, were. And, and then Sushant, people we... become a bit complacent about uh, going to get their vaccine. Apologies. Talk to us a little bit about herd immunity and, and why it's so important that not only a few people choose to get immunized or vaccinated, but that why we make um, vaccines compulsory. Um, herd immunity refers to the number of the people in the population at the population level who are immune to a disease. And it's very important because that uh, figure will determine how fast a virus or an, a, an illness can spread within the community. So to compare again with COVID at this point in time, um, the reason why, why COVID peaks and then the peak uh, levels off again is because there is some form of herd immunity that has developed. Um, even if it's not at the individual level, you know, we're not sure yet that if someone has caught COVID, whether they can still catch it again or not. But at the community level, if most people have been exposed to COVID and most people have some form of immunity, it means that COVID won't spread so fast um, throughout the community, but would spread slowly, you know, one or two people at a time instead of a big outbreak. Hmm. Um, and that's the same concept that we try and uh, induce with vaccines. If um, someone chooses not to have a vaccine, then that person is non-immune. Now, if they get exposed to that disease, they might get a very mild illness, for example, you know, a mild measles infection, and they might recover very well. But they might transmit measles to their friend next door who might die of the disease. Mm. Um, particularly, they might transmit measles to someone who can't get the vaccine, for example, a child less than six months of age who, who is not yet age eligible uh, for the vaccine. So herd immunity is the concept that um, we need to vaccinate the whole birth cohort uh, in order to get um, a good herd immunity to protect those individuals who are vulnerable to the disease and who are unable to be vaccinated. And very often that's the very young children. Mm. So essentially there's, there's a social responsibility for people to look out for the vulnerable in the community who aren't able to get a vaccine. But let, let's take it a little bit back to COVID. Exactly. I think that's a very important uh, focal point at the moment. Uh, we know thousands of scientists and doctors across the world are looking for a vaccine for COVID-19. What if we don't find one? Is there an alternative? What would life look like if we don't manage to find a vaccine? So we're all hoping that we will find one because I think that would um, really make our lives a lot easier. But if we don't find one, I think um, it will be that pattern that I described, that um, most people will be exposed to COVID in, in the so-called first wave when COVID spreads very rapidly. And then as time goes on, many people in the population will be immune. So COVID will always be there in the background and people will always be catching it and there will be deaths um, from COVID, but it won't spread like wildfire. It will spread slowly. There will just be one case here or there, two cases here or there. And um, it wouldn't cause this sort of fear and this uh, necessity to social distance and to have special personal protective equipment and all these, um, you know, interventions that have been put in place specifically because of the speed at which a new virus spreads through a non-immune um, community. So it would it would remain with us, but it wouldn't um, cause such terrible, um, you know, uh, um, such terrible death tolls as uh, we would see in the first wave of the virus. Right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Melinda Souchard from the NICD.